showtime. Hi folks, it's Brent Holland from Night Fright. Welcome to the show. Tonight we bring it to the memory and the glory of Martin Luther King Jr. Strap in and hang on. Here we go. There is a time to question. There is a time for answers. There is a time to challenge. There is a time to speculate. There is a time for change. There is a time for truth. The time is now. Welcome to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for Paranormal and Conspiracy Radio. And now your host, Brent Holland. This is what Oliver Stone had to say about Jim Douglas. My film JFK was a metaphor for all those doubts, suspicions, and unanswered questions. Now, an extraordinary new book, Oliver Stone's Words, offers the best account I have read of this tragedy and its significance. And that's the important part we're going to get into tonight, folks. That book is James Douglas's JFK and the unspeakable, why he died and why it matters. It is a book that deserves the attention of all Americans. It is one of those rare books that, by helping us understand our history, has the power to change it. The subtle sums of Douglas's purpose, why he died and why it matters. In his beautifully written and exhaustively researched treatment, Douglas lays out the motive for Kennedy's assassination. Simply, he traces a process of steady, conversion by Kennedy from his origins as a traditional cold warrior to his full determination to pull the world back from the edge of destruction. But don't take my word for it. Read this extraordinary book and reach your own conclusions. Ladies and gentlemen, it is truly, truly my pleasure to once again welcome Jim Douglas to the show. Jim, how are you, my friend? Doing well, Brent. And welcome being with you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The Lives, the Times of Dr. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Can we jump in right away? I think the most important thing that has happened since I spoke with you last... Yes, sir. ...is the availability, the new availability of all the basic information on Dr. King's assassination by the publication of the entire transcript, every word of the transcript of the trial that I attended in December, November and December of 1999, was the only trial ever held for Mm -hmm. Dr. King's assassination took place in Memphis. It was a civil trial. It was a civil trial, yes, yes, and a critically important Mm -hmm. trial. the only trial for his assassination and virtually ignored by um, U.S. media especially, but to a large extent by other media also. And that transcript, every word that I heard while in the courtroom with just a handful of people uh, that were observing the trial, and I was uh, one of two media people I'm hardly a media person, too. I write a book or two every so often. But uh, there was uh, a TV reporter from a Memphis station who's no longer alive, and myself. Uh, Wendell Stacy was the other man's name. Um, I want to mention his name because he is a great uh, human being, and he's no longer with us. But the trial transcript uh, was published in April 2009, less than a year ago as a paperback book, and it is titled The Thirteenth Juror. This is the most important thing I can say to uh, your listeners tonight, because it's far more than anything I can say on the program. This book, The Thirteenth Juror, 
can be found at www.mlkthetruth.com. That's the way you get it. You go to www.mlkthetruth.com, and uh, you can get the the entire trial as a paperback book. And just to and, interrupt you for a second, Jim, and of sure. course, folks, I will put that link on the website. So oh, wonderful. To interrupt you. Absolutely. And let me add that the Please response to, to that book, which is earth-shaking in its ramifications, has been total silence. Really? You know, that may scream loudest when there's silence. Perhaps total, silence total is loudest. Total silence. And uh, I've seen nothing, literally nothing, in print about it. Uh, uh, it's out there, and it's available, and it will get around basically by word of mouth and by programs like this that uh, have courageous people behind it. Thank you, sir. Now, let's just speculate for a second. What is so explosive in this document that the main major media is not covering it whatsoever? What I heard and what anyone can read in the transcript that's available in the 13th Juror is that Dr. King was assassinated by a conspiracy that included CIA, FBI, security forces from the U.S. Army, sniper team, Memphis police force people, and mafia intermediaries, and one defendant in the courtroom who admitted his involvement. And together, these forces carried out the assassination of Dr. King. A verdict was declared in this case that included the specific statement by the jurors, 12 jurors, an excellent jury, six black and six white uh, participants in the jury. The jury came to a verdict that it was a conspiracy involving all of those elements, and they specifically identified government agencies as involved in the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. That's what the media does not want to touch. Wow. Now, you know, when you mentioned all those elements coming together, you've got the military intelligence, you've got FBI, CIA, That's members right. of the mafia, right away, you know what triggered JFK. That's the same kind of conspiracy involved in killing the president. The same temple. And it laid, of course, the foundation for the killing of Malcolm X, which took place between JFK's really? and MLK's, Martin Luther King. So the foundation was laid. If you can kill the President of the United States by a high-level intelligence murder, by withdrawing his security, you can do the same thing in the case of Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and then Robert Kennedy in the four and a half years later. And it's the same kind of process in each case. Is it the same people pulling the strings? I wouldn't say so much the same people as the same institutions. Hmm. It includes a number of the same people, but the institutions continue until today. Hmm. And the people come and go. Some move in and out of different Plots. And, of course, within a relatively short time period, four and a half years, the key actors are going to be, to some degree, the same, such as at the higher levels. For example, Mr. Hoover or Mr. Helms, when we're talking about the CIA, Hoover in the case of the FBI, people like that are going to remain involved or James Jesus Angleton, mm. a, a character at a key counterintelligence uh, desk in the Central Intelligence Agency. These people will be involved in all of these plots. But that's not so much the point of the process as the institutional characteristics and the kind of process that was identified with the phrase plausible deniability in a in an earlier document that set the CIA loose globally without accountability. That's the kind of process that is involved in all of them. Wow. You know, sir, Jim Mars was here last week, and yeah. he has glowing admiration for you, as do I, as do most people that are familiar with your work. Jim it, Mars is a very good uh, writer and researcher, and I have 
great admiration for his work. Two of the best folks. Uh, just go to the www.nightfrightshow.com. You can download Jim's show from last week. All that to say, when he was here last week, I asked him, do you feel that Johnson, Vice President Johnson, who was the vice president when Kennedy was assassinated, was behind the assassination of JFK? He speculated. He was... Not hesitant, but he said he thinks so, but he can't prove it. Do you feel much along those same lines? I think that there is no question, and I'm sure Jim Mars would agree on this, mm -hmm. there's no question that Lyndon Johnson was involved in the cover-up of the assassination of John F. Kennedy, which was necessary for the assassination to take place at all, because they had to rely on a cover-up if they were going to kill the president. And that's not a question. Mm -hmm. Whether he was involved in the planning of the assassination, I can't really say. I think he had pre-knowledge. There's testimony uh, of that nature that is given by Madeline Brown, whom yes. Jim Mars knew, who was his mistress. She was, Linda jo she was Lyndon Johnson's mistress, and she has testified and she had a publicly to, to having knowledge of of his pre-knowledge mm -hmm. that he told her the night before and the morning of the assassination mm -hmm. that that uh, he wouldn't have to worry any anymore about uh, John Kennedy. But as to the, the planning of the assassination, I don't think Lyndon Johnson was a big enough player in the government to have been a major planner. But having pre-knowledge and going along with it and then covering it up is involvement enough for any one person. You had mentioned Malcolm X, and they use the, basically the same templates. I was wondering, is there any indication that perhaps Fabricant could have been behind the murder? Louis Farrakhan? Is Farrakhan. That... Yeah, I said Fabric. I, I, my apologies. Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan. Of well, Malcolm there is he himself, Minister Farrakhan himself, is perhaps the major source for that because he has given speeches in which he has basically stated a kind of disdain for anybody raising that question and saying that there was really no right to raise it because what we want to do, we can do. Those were, that was the basic kind of statement he has made. That's within Nation of Islam meetings, and they've been filmed in their public knowledge. And he has said in a more humble context that he acknowledges that he made statements in writing in the Nation of Islam newspaper that uh, added fuel to the fire that created the context of the assassination of Malcolm X. So he has said those things himself. So now he was a minister in Boston in the Nation of Islam, and he had been very close to Malcolm X prior to his leaving the nation. And, in fact, Louis Farrakhan's speaking is largely uh, an imitation of Malcolm. And, of course, Malcolm learned from other people, too. That's mm -hmm. not anything against Farrakhan. But there was a closeness, and then there was a hostility toward Malcolm that Farrakhan has taken both credit for and also backed away from in terms of issuing a statement of responsibility. And, and before Betty Shabazz died, and she had a kind of reconciliation, and that took place because one of uh, Betty's daughters and... I should just tell folks, Betty is um, Malcolm X's wife. That's correct, yes. yes. Of mm -hmm. course, Betty Shabazz, Malcolm X's wife and widow, who died in a, a tragic fire mm. set by her, her very disturbed grandson in the late 90s. She had held Farrakhan responsible herself for Malcolm's murder. I, I'm not saying as an exclusive character, but as a, a participant in the murder. It's, he certainly didn't do it by himself or... Mm nor was he, you know, any kind of solitary conspirator or anything thing of that nature. But she held him as a key player in it and it stated that publicly. But when her daughter was set up by the FBI um, to, in a, an operation 
in which a uh, an undercover FBI person, uh, an operative for the FBI, said he would try to kill Louis Farrakhan on behalf of Betty Shabazz's daughter, who herself was in a very difficult mental state at that time. That setup and the re- its revelation brought those two people together, Louis Farrakhan and Betty Shabazz. And so there was that sort of unintended government reconcil- <laughs> government-inspired <laughs> reconciliation of Farrakhan and Shabazz that took place in the 90s. Sir, in your own research, did you find any credibility to those allegations, or are we going down the wrong road by me bringing? Oh no, up? there's definite credibility to I it, see. and and Farrakhan himself says there's there is in terms of his acceptance of responsibility, mm. but there is there more to it than his saying that he simply created a context for it. Mm. There probably is, but I don't have any direct evidence. Understood. Uh, I go with what is available publicly and what I know, Mm -hmm. and I'm not going to accuse Louis Farrakhan of things that that I can't prove or establish, but only according to what he has said and what other witnesses have said. And there there is no direct witness confirmation of Farrakhan's role that I'm aware of. And your research is impeccable, and I just want to remind folks, the reason why people in the community gravitate towards Jim's work is precisely that. He looks at what's available and states it with all full integrity. He won't put something out that he doesn't believe in. And you have to admire that. I would recommend everybody, do yourself a favor. I'm going to plug your book again right now, Jim, if you don't mind. JFK and the Unspeakable, Why He Died and Why It Matters. If you go to the www.nightfrightshow.com website, as always, click on the book cover, take you to Chapters Indigo, online, order it from the comfort of your own home. You don't even have to leave your living room. It should be there within 48 hours maximum, I would suggest. If not, if you're physically close to a chapter's indigo, go ahead, go down and grab it, because it's impeccable. It really is. Oliver Stone was full of accolades for it, and justifiably so. Our guest tonight, of course, is James Douglas. We're talking about The Life, The Times, Dr. Martin Luther King, and Malcolm X. Similarities between the two. Are there a lot of red flags going off? They are complementary. I wouldn't Mm. call them so much similar. Now, are we talking about their characters or about their assassinations? For a moment, I was going off on their characters. I would like to discuss their characters and then come back to the assassination because I find Malcolm X went through a whole... He reminds me, in a sense, like Kennedy. Now, folks, don't jump on me for saying that. But Kennedy started out as a cold warrior, as everybody knows. And he certainly didn't become a dove near the end, but he looked for dialogue. Yeah. He looked for, he knew what was at stake with war, and he was looking for an alternative to that. Malcolm X, in my mind, started out as a racist. Uh, he hated white people with a passion. They were demons, they were devils. Towards the end, he had changed. And, that is true. And I would like to discuss some of their characters, if you don't mind, Dr. King's and Malcolm's, where they came together, where they differed. They were complementary, in my mind, because First of all, uh, Malcolm X was never a person who spoke in terms of nonviolence. Never, he didn't. He didn't like that uh, way of addressing things. That's right. Yeah. And he was extremely critical publicly of Martin Luther King at the same time as he admired him privately. And there was something of the same in King over against Malcolm. He mm-hmm. did not use the, any kind of the terminology that. Malcolm used, certainly with regard to the violent terminology that Malcolm seemed to express, especially in his early stage when he was with the Nation of Islam, and even the self-defense statements that Malcolm made, which had violent overtones after he left the Nation of Islam, that was all anathema to Dr. King. And yet he did admire Malcolm, and his wife, Coretta King, met Malcolm, talked with him. King also met Malcolm one time. Dr. King met him in uh, the Capitol in Washington, D.C. for just a few minutes one day. But Coretta Scott King, when she met Malcolm, which was just about uh, a week and a half to two weeks before Malcolm's death in Selma, Alabama when her husband Martin was in prison, so he didn't meet Malcolm. That was an extraordinary meeting, and maybe I should just describe that for a moment, because it relates to both human beings. 
King in jail and Malcolm on his way to his own assassination. Malcolm had in, had been invited to Tuskegee by members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, and he spoke there in Tuskegee and was invited to come the next day over to Selma by some of the same radical students. There were heavy demonstrations going on. This was in 1965. People were working hard for voter registration, and a number of people were being arrested regularly, and that included Dr. King, who was in prison. Mm -hmm. And when Malcolm went over to, at the invitation of many of the students who were involved in the demonstrations, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference of Dr. King, their leadership was petrified. <laughs> Malcolm's coming. And Malcolm X was uh, a symbol of a very different approach and not one that they wanted to have created in their midst while they were having nonviolent demonstrations. So when Malcolm came over, they, they tried to somehow control it and somewhat discouraged him from talking. And Malcolm just sort of sat there when he was in a room with them and smiled, you know, what's going on here? I'm not supposed to say anything. I've been invited by these students. And what they did, because they didn't have Dr. King, quote, to balance Malcolm or to somehow prevail in a struggle with him, they put Coretta on the stage just after him. Um, and uh, he spoke and Coretta spoke, but they did not combat each other. Uh, Mal what Malcolm did was he he spoke about human rights. He said, uh, you're, you're here to demonstrate for civil rights. He said, I'm not going to in any way try to denigrate what you're doing. Mm -hmm. What you're doing is, is courageous. What you're doing is powerful. What you're doing is important. I would only like to put it in the context of something that goes beyond civil rights, and that's human rights. And Malcolm was at that point doing a global campaign, especially uh, among African nations, to put the United States on trial in the United Nations for um, uh, the violation, U.S. violation of the human rights of African Americans, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. as South Africa did uh, and uh, for so many years with apartheid. He was using them as parallels, and that was a major reason for, reason for Malcolm's assassination. And so Coretta Scott King, when he finished, uh, got together with him, and he said, Mrs. King, I want you to please... Um, so, can I just say, folks, uh, Coretta was Dr. King's wife, just for those... That's that exactly are right, aware. yeah. Coretta Scott King, Dr. Mm -hmm. King's Forget wife. Her. She, she uh, listened very carefully, and Malcolm said, please tell Dr. King that I'm not here to in any way undermine his work. What I want to uh, do is tell people that if they don't connect with him, uh, a worse kind of approach could happen. <laughs> so he's sort of, he's sort of a, uh, a strange way of supporting Dr. King's work. <laughs> that's, what, that's, that's the kind of person Malcolm was and the kind of way he, he quote, complimented Dr. King. Uh, but he said also that I would love to talk with him and meet with him in jail, but I can't because I have to go quickly to London for a meeting there. And that, that kind of connection, though, that was happening, at least in a quiet way, between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, who had significantly different approaches, and yet complementary in the sense that Dr. King was, was certainly um, uh, respectful of Malcolm's uh, bringing up the issue of human rights and putting the whole issue of racism in terms of international law, of course King would have support that. It actually went beyond King at that point. <laughs> it was an approach uh, that was more global in terms of Malcolm's vision of international law and his having a, even an office at the United Nations at that point. King was watching carefully what Malcolm was doing and was supportive of it. Uh, that was the part of Malcolm's vision that King thought was, uh, was transforming and that Coretta King respected deeply when she heard this deep and sensitive human being talking to her and saying that he didn't want to do anything to, uh, to hurt uh, Dr. King's work. Mm. And she, she writes about that in her, her autobiography, and she, of course, uh, uh, gave that message to her husband, and uh, <clears throat> a week and a half later, Malcolm was dead. Jim, I've got to do this break right now, but I, I want you to stay on the line. What I do is I read out the various call letters of the station, 
sure. that are syndicating the show. But when we come back, I would like to continue this line of the comparison between the two, but go into their assassinations. And of course, yeah. we will be answering why they were killed. Yeah. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. Folks, right now you're listening to CKLU 96.7 FM, where we broadcast right out of beautiful Sudbury, Ontario, where it was actually pretty brisk and pretty snowy today, but apparently not as brisk as Birmingham, Alabama, where right now I would say it's about minus 12 Celsius, and here in Sudbury it's only minus 1 Celsius. Jim, you're more than welcome to come up and warm your toes by the fire here in Sudbury, as they say. Well, I'd I'd love to do that, but perhaps not tonight. (laughs) Okay. And by the way, folks, Jim is a transplanted Canadian. He holds both American and Canadian citizenship. And my home is Headley, British Columbia. (laughs) There you go. Beautiful place. And, you know, we've got four stations in in British Columbia broadcasting this show, so very, very proud of that. I'm Brent Holland. You're listening to Night Fright. Of course, I want to say a special hi to our general manager here at Laurentian University, CKLU, Deborah Frankel. You're also listening to Caper Radio at Cape Breton University in Sydney, Nova Scotia, God's country, as my grandfather used to say. He's a Maritimer. Wednesdays from 3.30 in the afternoon to 5.30 in the evening. Matthew Burke is the general manager there and a good buddy of mine. Jason Wellwood, how you doing, buddy? Hope things are well with you. He's over at CILU 102.7 FM, Lakehead University, rockin' Thunder Bay. The reason why I say rockin' Thunder Bay, because it actually does rock. And also, it's the home of Paul Schaefer, for all you Letterman fans. Yep, Paul Schaefer's from Thunder Bay. Sunday nights, midnight to 2 a.m., there at Lakehead University. CJMQ 88.9 FM, the voice of the eastern townships in Sherbrooke, Quebec, one hour south of my own old hometown of Montreal. And if you're listening right now in Montreal, I want to say merci beaucoup. Vous êtes très gentil. You can listen there Saturdays, 10 p.m. to midnight. I want to say hi to my good buddy, David Teasdale, who's the general manager there. Jared McKittiak, he's over at the University of Manitoba. Canada has all these beautiful, beautiful campuses. I was down at the University of Toronto today in Toronto. I drove back for the show and then be leaving at midnight <laughs> back to Toronto. Amazing campus. Just beautiful. Not not far from, um, I was going to say Ryerson. What's the name of the other one? Uh, York. York University. Sorry. Beautiful campus there. All these incredible, Laurentian's beautiful. Incredible, incredible, beautiful campuses there. Anyways, that's in Winnipeg, Manitoba. As you know, CJUM 101.5 FM. And they broadcast Wednesday nights, Thursday mornings, 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. And Jared McKittiak, of course, is my my good buddy over there. Sound FM 100.3 University of Waterloo in Waterloo, Ontario. Tuesday nights, Wednesday mornings, 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. There are three shows of Night Fright there, back to back. Road Dog, he's the buddy over there. Hope things are well with you. I'm going to do some more after. There's a bunch more stations and we have a new station tonight. And I think I'll mention them right now and I'll mention them again in the second part of this, which is CIDO 97.7 FM on the FM dial. If you guys are listening right now, thanks guys. Thanks so much for picking up Night Fright. They're the voice of the valley in Creston, British Columbia. Thursday nights, 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. And how you doing, Tim Davis? Thanks so much for your email and uh, kudos to you. Thank you so much for supporting Night Fright, Canadian Venture. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. Now I want to point you right away to the www.nightfrightshow.com website. www.nightfrightshow.com website. When you're there, you will find a wealth of information. The most important thing there, folks, is the archives. And I say that with full conviction because, you know, this show is a volunteer gig. Nobody gets paid for this show, and either do the guests come on. And we've had some amazing guests 
As I said last week, we had Jim Mars. You can download his show for free, and he was astounding. We also had Dan Aykroyd's father on here, Peter Aykroyd. He was talking about his book, A History of Ghosts. Incredible show. You know, uh, our guest tonight, James Douglas, was here back in May of last year. You can download his show as well. A great, great show, without question. Shows there on Bigfoot, shows there on uh, ghost hunting. We did a whole series, as you know, on JFK last November, First Person Witnesses. Dr. Robert McClellan was here. He was the surgeon that JFK was brought to when he was fatally wounded, and he worked on JFK. First person witness, I mean, he was standing right beside JFK. Think about it this way. If you had a chance to hear what the doctor who worked on Lincoln would have to say, that show is there for you, as always, to download free. www.brentholandshow.com www.nightfrightshow.com Dot com. I have two shows and I have to apologize. And the reason why I mentioned the other show is I have a very special announcement to make that concerns both shows. Ted Sorensen will be my guest on the Brent Holland Show. And I will take that interview and put it up on the Night Fright website. And you can bet your bottom dollar we will be discussing the assassination. For those of you who are unfamiliar who Ted Sorensen was, is Ted Sorensen was probably JFK's closest advisor. He was right there in the Oval Office making suggestions during the Cuban Missile Crisis, during the Bay of Pigs, civil rights, the Berlin Crisis, and of course the assassination. So Ted Sorensen, I will be interviewing him next week and I will put that interview right up on the Night Fright website as well, www.nightfrightshow.com. Right now our guest of course is the one, the only Jim Douglas. Jim Douglas of course has written an incredible book, passionate book, JFK and the Unspeakable. It has got accolades right across the board. Oliver Stone wrote beautiful, beautiful words about this book, why he died and why it matters. Do yourself a favor, go pick it up. If you want to read probably the best book on why he was killed, this is the book for you. You can pick it up at any chapters in the go, right across the country as always, or simply just go to the www.nightfrightshow.com website. Click on that book cover as always. It will take you to Chapters Indigo Online where you can order it. And now back to Jim. Jim, before the break, I had mentioned to you I wanted to continue on the line of thought that we were discussing before. Yeah. First, we did the comparisons of the two characters, Dr. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Now I would like to discuss the commonalities of both their assassinations and as well as the most important question, why were they killed? Each of them was a prophet. Mm. <coughs> a prophet in the sense that um, both Malcolm and Martin said to all of us who were around at that time that unless we changed, uh, unless we took a different direction, unless we moved on the issues of racism, economic inequality, mm -hmm. exploitation, injustice, and peace, especially in relation to the Vietnam War, in which Malcolm was earlier uh, in resistance to than Martin was, unless we moved on those issues <coughs> and turned, turned, as prophets always tell us to do, mm -hmm. we would be in for a worse and worse and worse future, as has in fact been the case, because we didn't respond deeply enough to either of those prophets. In the case of Malcolm X, he spoke to people, especially black people in the North. Uh, Malcolm was a person of the cities. He was a person of Harlem. He was a, a person of Detroit. He was called Detroit Red when he was a, a hustler and when he was a a dope pusher, and he was a person who spoke especially to urban blacks and people of uh, on the underside of the uh, economy and the culture in the North. Martin Luther King, a person from the South, from Atlanta, from a church background with 
uh, a father and a grandfather in the ministry uh, and himself a minister. He spoke especially to the uh, religiously, uh, in the sense of Christian-based communities uh, that were represented by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. But in the case of Martin, who outlived Malcolm, he followed uh, some of the uh, indications that Malcolm gave him so that Martin became a person more and more in the areas where Malcolm lived and died. And, and Martin went to Chicago, for example, and experienced the kind of uh, racism and poverty in Chicago that uh, Malcolm was speaking about out of Harlem especially. So Martin in a sense was following the lead of Malcolm and that helped get him killed. So the, the two again are talking about them being complementary. But the, the basic vision of Malcolm kept changing and while as you indicated earlier in his career uh, he was working with the Nation of Islam and had an attitude and a, um, a theology which said white people were devils and that uh, it really depended on a, a total process of segregation. In other words, <laughs> he, he in, a, in a, a reverse way was, uh, in following Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Nation of Islam, was, was agreeing with uh, the Klan. Uh, except that uh, he said black people should be self-sufficient and stay among themselves to gain power over against the white people uh, that might be represented racially by the Klan. But he changed, and when he left the Nation of Islam and when he uh, created his own uh, uh, organization in Harlem, both a religious and a secular one, Organization of African American Unity was the secular, and the religious was the Muslim mosque. When he did that, he then uh, went on a hajj, a pilgrimage, uh, which is, of course, the, the deepest thing that uh, a Muslim can do, mm -hmm. and, and embraced a, a far more vibrant and traditional Islam and uh, embraced white people in the process. And from that point on, Malcolm was truly an international person in every sense, and a truly a, a, a person of total community in every sense. Um, and so both of them were, were moving, Martin moving mm -hmm. in a way, and Martin in Malcolm's steps as he, as he outlived uh, Malcolm, and moving into the same areas that uh, Malcolm had been in. You know, I think it was quite an epiphany for him when he went on Hodge. And uh, Hodge, folks, for, for you folks that don't know, um, they go to Mecca and they do their seven, I think it's seven turns around uh, the Cabal, which is the um, the rock. Um, geez, help me out here, Jim, if you can. <laughs> I'm trying to remember it all from the top of my head. Well, we don't have to go through the whole Hodge. The, the key thing is that, it was that an Malcolm, as Malcolm put it himself in the, in the uh, uh, experience, as he described it afterwards, I saw people from all over the world uh, who were white as well as, as black and who were um, of, of every kind of variation of mm -hmm. skin color and all acting together as one family. Uh, and in that kind of experience, I, uh, you know, he said, he said, I saw a new way of, of, of uh, looking at things. So when he came back from that hodge, he was no longer in any sense, although he was already moving beyond it to some degree, um, in the same uh, kind of theology he had been in as, as, a, as a member of the Nation of Islam. When you did your research and looked into the both assassinations, I'm going to ask you to name names. Was there a lot of the same names that came up? Uh, in terms of, um, you had mentioned Dick Bissell before, not Dick Bissell, I'm sorry, um, uh, head of the CIA, uh, Richard, um, uh, Dick Russell. Oh, uh, Richard Helms. Richard Helms, where was I Richard, going? Richard Helms. Dick, yeah. Dick Helms. Dick Helms. Yeah. <laughs> I got all so the... There's, there's a Dick Russell who's a, a researcher on these right. issues. <laughs> but uh, yeah. uh, Richard, Richard, Richard Helms. Helms 
you can't, you, in the case of Malcolm, uh, it's much harder to go up the line uh, because in the case of Malcolm, there isn't that kind of uh, traceability, really. Mm. Malcolm was definitely killed by uh, shooters who were members of the Nation of Islam. Uh, nobody, nobody argues that. What is what is uh, more complex are the forces behind his killing, and also it's it's very difficult for people to argue that the Nation of Islam uh, was not infiltrated by U.S. intelligence agencies. It obviously was heavily, heavily infiltrated, and it's at even at higher levels. Mm. But to to keep going up the line because of the heavy involvement of uh, the NOI, the Nation of Islam, at the lower level in the killing of, of Malcolm. And because they were so well infiltrated, uh, and it, it was so easily done, actually, because of the infighting and hostility within the nation, uh, the, the killing of, of Malcolm X was a kind of... Uh, uh, from the standpoint of intelligence agencies was a kind of model in that it was done largely uh, by black on black, and that's what they wanted to happen. In the case of Martin Luther mm -hmm. King, it was not as easy to do that. And, in fact, it was <laughs> uh, a lot of black people uh, would, uh, would find it a, a much harder to move against Martin because Martin didn't come out of uh, an experience of leaving a black community and there wasn't that that fomenting of one over against the other that the FBI did so skillfully between Malcolm X and his mentor Elijah Muhammad. Do you think the initial desire to remove Malcolm came from the Nation of Islam or do you think it came from that template that was in place that killed Kennedy? In other words, from the government. The Efforts to kill Malcolm began in the 1950s. <clears throat> uh, we can go all the way back to an effort to kill him by the New York, uh, well, in the mm -hmm. in the uh, immediate sense, by the New York Police Department, which, of course, uh, New York Police Department, uh, and in the case of, of the actual killing of Malcolm, they had a desk uh, from the FBI really? in their in their headquarters, so Holy all cow. all the intelligence that was drawn from uh, an infiltrator from uh, a part of the New York Police Department right. called Bossy, that was uh, an intelligence agency within the New York Police Department. It all went immediately to the FBI because the the man uh, Gene Roberts, whom mm -hmm. I interviewed, who was Malcolm's security. Uh, person uh, who was a, also a New York Police Department representative, um, who was infiltrating his security. Uh, that 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 uh, information that went daily to the uh, New York Police Department was just instantly given uh, at the same time to the FBI. So you can't really distinguish the forces. Uh, you know, people say, "Well, was it the police or?" Or was it the uh, higher levels? It was both. They were working together. Intended. And in the 1950s, there was an effort to kill Malcolm that was uh, that preceded his his actual uh, killing uh, uh, way before um, there were these heavy conflicts within the nation of Islam. So, wow. and that at that point, uh, Malcolm was uh, working with people like uh, Fidel Castro, who came to Harlem. He was visiting with people down at the United Nations. This is when Malcolm mm -hmm. was had a mosque in Harlem, and so that that entirely precedes all of these uh, conflicts, big conflicts with Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. I can hear that wonderful train in the background. <laughs> we live next to the railroad. I know <laughs> we, we heard it last time, as do we here in Sudbury. Um, Jim, to stay on that, you just mentioned you spoke with the fellow that was in charge of Malcolm's security. Was he there that fateful day in 1965? Yes, he wasn't in charge of Malcolm's security. This is Gene Roberts is his name. I see. Uh, Gene Roberts uh, <clears throat> was a um, an infiltrator into the security. Oh, I and see. Now he was I get a security, it. He was a security guard. Now, uh, 
he predicted the assassination. This is the way he described it to me when I interviewed him. He said the Wednesday before the Sunday, mm -hmm. Malcolm was killed uh, at the same location, the Audubon Ballroom. Malcolm gave a, a speech, and uh, Gene Roberts was on security that night, watching, uh, standing not far from Malcolm, watching the audience, and he saw what he thought was a trial run for the killing of Malcolm. It involved uh, a kind of of uh, <clears throat> activity in the back of the room to distract people's attention, and then. Uh, some movements of some characters in the in the audience in ways that he thought was kind of playing out something as a trial run, and he uh, then reported that to his superiors, and he warned them. Uh, it's not like Gene Roberts was part of the um, intentionally part of the assassination of Malcolm X. Understood, understood. Gene, Gene mm -hmm. Roberts had by that time been converted by Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. He was he was an African-American who uh, was inspired in a lot of ways mm -hmm. by Malcolm at the same time as he was working for the New York Police Department and giving them information on Malcolm. So he thought as a police officer he should uh, warn them because they're supposed to be providing security at, to a public figure like Malcolm X. So he said, look, it's, it's going to happen. It's coming down. I can feel it uh, by what was going on out there today. And they said, uh, his superiors to whom he reported said, okay, we'll pass it on, which, of course, meant passing it on to the FBI and other intelligence agencies. But uh, that following Sunday, when Gene Roberts was present and had just gone off the so-called guard duty, um, he watched from the audience as the same thing happened. There was a uh, provocative action in the rear of the ballroom where uh, a man said to another man, both of them conspirators, get your hand out of my pocket, and sort of acted like one was trying to steal from the other. And then a smoke bomb went off. Uh, that was a much bigger thing that had happened the previous Wednesday. And then while people's attention was distracted, toward the rear of the Audubon, then two men in the front row stood up with pistols, and a man in the second row with a uh, shotgun, sawed-off shotgun, and uh, uh, all fired on Malcolm. And at that point, Gene Roberts, the security guard, who was also an infiltrator, he ran forward, and he was one of the first persons to reach Malcolm and tried to give him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and to uh, to save his life. And when he, re you know, when he's reported in on all of this, uh, and also he was almost shot himself when he was moving forward and trying to stop the people who had shot uh, Malcolm, all of this didn't go down well with the New York Police Department. And they, he was asked why he tried, to, uh, he tried to revive Malcolm, and he said, well, because I'm a cop. So he had a different attitude toward it all than uh, the people to whom he was reporting. He was an honorable man. Why is peace, men who come out for peace, people who come out for peace, so threatening to those in power? I mean, JFK wanted to stop the Cold War. Malcolm X spoke out about the Vietnam War. He was moving towards peace. Dr. King, without question, he was against the war from day one. Bobby Kennedy wanted to stop the war. Four big assassinations. Why is it such a threat to have peace in the world? Well, for you and, and I, it is perhaps not that threat. Uh, but for someone who, on the one hand, identifies uh, their security in terms of millions or even billions of dollars um, in profits and that are dependent upon war making and who projects uh, power in such a way that there are enemies that require the spending of all that money that results in their <laughs> their pockets getting pretty big it's a very, very uh, different uh, way of looking at the world. And 
the United States especially, and unfortunately uh, today, has has institutions that have profited uh, immensely, as, as has every other country, but especially in this country, from, on the one hand, the Cold War, and now its successor, the so-called War on Terror, which is a, a, a war of terrorism itself. And I think that the threat of peace is more the threat to the kind of security that is identified with a great deal of, uh, of power and a great deal of, of money, and then that gets projected into ideologies that are called either anti-communism or anti-terrorism, and that uh, involve, unfortunately, the exploitation of a lot of people. I have to do another quick break, but when we come back, I want to talk about false flag operations Yes. And creating adversaries. Yeah. If that's okay with you. Folks, our guest today, James W. Douglas, JFK and the Unspeakable, Why He Died and Why It Matters is his book. He's also working on another book, obviously, about Dr. King and Malcolm X. I urge you, go get the book. Really, get the book. Uh, if you're listening to this show now and this show is intriguing you, the book is phenomenal, uh, JFK and the Unspeakable. It tells you why, point by point by point, incredibly researched, impeccable, profound, why he was killed. And this is what we have to know to educate ourselves so we can look for a repeating pattern. And that pattern comes up again after JFK with Malcolm X, once again with Dr. King, and but two months after that, Bobby Kennedy. When when we come back, I'm going to ask him about that repeating pattern if it goes on today. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. Right now you're listening to CIVL 88.7 FM, University of the Fraser Valley, Abbotsford, British Columbia. Thursdays, 2 p.m. to 4, 4 p.m., my mistake. Friday mornings at 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. I want to say hi to my friend Amos Evans, who's the general manager out there. The Hutch, Gerald the Hutch Hutchman. He's over at CFAD 92.1 FM in Salamo and Ymir, British Columbia. What can I tell you? British Columbia loves night fright. And and that's Salamo Radio, Saturday evenings, 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. CFUR 88.7 FM, University of Northern British Columbia, Prince George, British Columbia. And thank you all in British Columbia for listening to Night Fright and making us the number one Canadian-based show of its genre in the country. And I want to thank you truly, truly from the bottom of my heart because that just makes it all so much worthwhile doing this volunteer gig. I want to thank you so much for that. Friday night, Saturday mornings 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. Christopher Earl. Thank you, Christopher. Kurt Wetmore is over at CFXU 93.3 FM, St. Francis Xavier University in Antigonish, Nova Scotia, Saturday evenings, 10 p.m. to midnight. CIDO, the newest addition to the Night Fight family. CIDO 97.7 FM, the voice of the valley in Creston, British Columbia beautiful crest in British Columbia, right on the border of uh, the United States and Canada. Thursdays, 11 p.m. to 1 a.m., Tim Davis. Coming up next week on the www.nightfrightshow.com website, www.nightfrightshow.com website, we've got 2012, a whole month of 2012, where we're going to examine the spiritual aspects of 2012, we're going to look at all the folklore of 2012 in the second week. Third week, Crystal Skulls in 2012. And the final week, Apocalypse in 2012. Stick around for those. Those are amazing shows. Um, all that coming up. Also, uh, we've got a whole a series on vampires coming up in, in April. So if you're into vampires... Those are the shows for you. And we're going to do some more conspiracy shows without question. We're going to have a few other guests coming in because uh, the anniversary, of, of course, of Dr. King's assassination is coming up as well as Bobby's. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. We're speaking with Jim Douglas. Jim Douglas, uh, 
Just let me read you a little bit more about what Oliver Stone wrote about Jim Douglas, about his book, JFK and the Unspeakable. My film JFK was a metaphor for all those doubts, suspicions, and unanswered questions. Now an extraordinary new book. I like when he writes extraordinary new book, and it truly is an extraordinary book. Offers the best account I have read of this tragedy and its significance. That book is James Douglas's JFK and the unspeakable www.nightfrightshow.com click on the book cover buy the book do yourself a huge favor if you have a library of books already on the assassination or if this is your first book this is the book to get do yourself a favor read the book find out why he was killed all the other stuff is smoke and mirrors This is the real deal, folks. Our guest tonight, Jim Douglas. Before the break, Jim, I had asked you if we could perhaps continue along and look at the various reasons behind the peace movement, I guess, um, that was very prominent in the 60s. I grew up in the 60s, although I was just a kid. Uh, But I still remember Peace Man and Groovy and and everything else. But unfortunately, we picked on... I think where we fell flat is when the Vietnam soldiers came home and people were spitting on them and things of that nature. I was wondering if we could pick up where we left off and continue telling the folks about the life and times of Dr. Martin Luther King and also Malcolm X. Well, Martin Luther King and and Malcolm both entered into stages where they became threatening to the powers that be, and I already described Malcolm's more than Martin stage, where Malcolm was organizing internationally, and during the last year of his life spent uh, about half the time in Africa organizing nationalist leaders to come together in the United Nations to indict the United States along South Africa for violations of human rights against black people. In the case of Martin Luther King, he was moving into economics as well as resistance to the Vietnam War. The resistance to the Vietnam War took up, especially the last year of his life, literally the one year to the mm-hmm. day before his assassination, he gave the greatest speech of his life, which sure was did. his Riverside Church Address, mm-hmm. uh, April 4, 1967. <clears throat> and in that address... He came out so powerfully against the United States that J. Edgar Hoover wrote a uh, a memorandum to Lyndon Johnson stating that um, <clears throat> Martin Luther King um, had become a danger to the security of the United States. Uh, it's a very uh, significant statement. He said, uh, based on King's recent activities and public utterances, it is clear that he is an instrument in the hands <clears throat> excuse me, of subversive forces seeking to undermine our nation. And that kind of attitude within the uh, security forces of the United States led to Dr. King's death. It was only two weeks later that a man named James Earl Ray, who would wind up being the um, publicly identified killer of King, even though he did not fired the shot and was uh, basically a patsy or a, a scapegoat. Two weeks after King gave that speech, James Earl Ray escaped or mm-hmm. was released, um, which is more likely from his Missouri State Prison, and, and was then shepherded. Could I just interrupt you for a sec? I, wanna, yeah. I wanted to clarify something with you, and I know of you've course, done the research. You had mentioned that it looked like the FBI were going to go after Dr. King big time. Yes. There has been this horrible rumor, and I was hoping you could clarify it for me and the audience, that Dr. King, according to the FBI, was screwing women like, what did Hoover's quote, something to the effect of a chimpanzee or something. He was taking women back to his hotel rooms and having his way with them, sexual orgies. Is there any truth to this allocation? Well, the truth to the allocation is, is uh, number one, yes, sir? that the FBI was trying to exaggerating anything that could possibly be used against Dr. King hmm. in a way that would destroy him, both 
uh, both uh, in terms of his reputation and and his life. Uh, secondly, uh, it is biographically true, as all his you know all his biographers mm-hmm. state, that Dr. King was not a person of total fidelity in his in his marriage. So those sort of have to stand alongside each other. Uh, Dr. King had faults, and he was deeply aware of them, and he was, but however, he was not the kind of person that was represented by the FBI in, in any measure at all. And the FBI was trying to destroy him in the same way that it had previously tried to destroy the relationship between Malcolm X and Elijah Mohammed. And in the case of Elijah and Malcolm, they succeeded far more than they did with, uh, mm. with Dr. King. Understood, then, sir. Thank you so, for that. So on the one hand, Dr. King was not a saint, mm-hmm. and he was a person who had moral faults, just as John Kennedy, for example, did, and for that matter, just as all of us do. And if any of us were put on a, uh, a global oh, screen, yeah. <laughs> we would not be in real good shape in terms of our... Um, our moral dignity and uh, and character. Only and, one guy and, I know uh, that... The FBI was trying to destroy King in that way. Okay, I was going to say, only one guy I know that ever walked on water. Yeah. <laughs> and they ended up crucifying him, too. That's um, right. Let's continue along, and I, um, I just wanted to clarify that. I think it's yes, important to bring uh, out and, everything. And it is, truth. and whether or not the tapes that they used yes, had sir? anything of significance on them, is uh, is total speculation, and they used tapes that they claimed uh, were tapes of Dr. King and, mm-hmm. and women that they recorded. Well, the very fact that they were trying to record such things yeah. is far more incriminating of the uh, of the Federal Bureau of Investigation Precisely. than it is of anybody who might have been engaged in such actions. Horrible, eh? Uh, you know, when you think that your own government is trying to persecute you and the land of the free, as they say. And don't think this couldn't happen here in Canada, folks. Uh, Be it not prudent. only could happen, it, it has, has happened, happened in some respect. But let, let yeah, me say, sure, give sir. an example of, the, of what the FBI was trying to do. Yes, sir. And at the time that Dr. King was given his uh, Nobel Peace Prize, at, at, in, in precisely the, the period leading up to that, in the month or two before that, uh, he was... Uh, sent a letter, actually was sent to his, his wife, Coretta Scott King, in which a tape recording was included, supposedly, of, of Dr. King and, and uh, other people in a, a motel room or a hotel room, yes. or maybe it was, a, it was a combination of tapes. And a letter was written to King that Coretta Scott King read before uh, he did, uh, suggesting that um, he should uh, kill himself because the people who had this information, and he knew as soon as he saw the tape and as FBI. soon as he and Coretta examined it and other members of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, they knew this came from the FBI. And the letter said he should kill himself because this tape was going to be circulated widely and his, he was going to be destroyed, his reputation, and so forth. And uh, so they were making an effort by this tape, on the one hand, to destroy him publicly, and on the other hand, to push him to uh, to suicide. And they were drawing on a portrait of him that that revealed the fact that he had attempted suicide when he was a uh, a young man because of the because of his grandmother's uh, death. You know that's blackmail, but that is also part of the template that they used against JFK. It is because Hoover had summoned. And I use the word summoned on purposely, folks, because Hoover thought he was king of the world, if you will. Summoned Bobby Kennedy into his office to expose Jack Kennedy's infidelity and to yeah. kind of back channel and threaten Jack. And it's the same damn template he used on, on Martin Luther King. Yes, and on anybody um, in uh, any country where forces are trying to to uh, prevent That's right. any kind of major change. Man, can we speak a little bit about James Earl Ray? Now, as I had mentioned before, I'm going to set this up just a little bit and try and get a little bit of Montreal in here at the same time. Yes. 
if you go to the www.nightfrightshow.com website, folks, click on the pictures there. Scroll down near the bottom. I'm from Montreal, as you all know. I don't hide that fact or anything. Place to be from. There you go. I have taken pictures of where James Earl Ray was spotted in Montreal, and that's on De La Commune Street, 121 West De La Commune, right around the corner from there. Five years earlier in 1963, guess who was spotted? Lee Harvey Oswald. I've taken pictures of that too. Those are free for you to download, by the way. Go up the street three blocks. You're going to find McGill University. McGill University is associated with MK Ultra Mind Control, the Allen Memorial Hospital. I've taken pictures of that also. So if anybody wants to go there and download those pictures, help yourself. And, and that institution is connected indirectly with the assassination of Robert Kennedy. Is it really? In terms of the the um, uh, assassin or yes, really the scapegoat, Sirhan Sirhan, being a person that is uh, understandable really yes. only in terms of, of mind control. And a lot of those techniques were developed at the institution you were just describing. That's explosive. And Jim, if you feel free, I've also put a, a Google map up there, and I've put a little X where Lee Harvey Oswald was spotted right around the corner, of course, from um, uh, James Earl Ray, and then just up the street. You can find the buildings perfectly, and I've taken frontal shots of all those places. And according to James Earl Ray, that's where he, he, he met his, Raul. his shepherd, Raul, yeah. who's in Montreal yeah. at a bar. And by the way, folks, it was a gay bar in those days. I just mentioned that in passing because in the 60s, 1967, this was summer of, guess what, the Expo 67. You know, being gay, you were still really in the closet completely. That's right. If you came out, you were persecuted completely, absolutely uh, demified, just, just horrible things that uh, homosexuals went through in those days. And now look at us. Here's a good case of how people evolve. We allow marriages here in Canada. And I, I think that kudos to the country for that. Amen. There we go. Let's go back. I apologize for getting off track, but I just wanted to tell people those photos are there, and that's the Montreal connection sure. in those three. Sure. Can we talk a little bit about James Earl Ray? You had mentioned before that by coincidence, quote unquote, he was either released from jail or he escaped or was helped, perhaps, to escape from jail, or made it look like he escaped? Yes, there there are indications, and there are kinds of um, uh, witnesses that are really uh, not as visible as we would hope, who have suggested that, um, for example, Walter Fauntroy, who was a representative of uh, the District of Columbia yes. without a vote in Congress, but a representative who did sit in in Congress. Uh, he, during the House Select Committee on Assassinations in the 1970s, uh, he believed that uh, James Earl Ray uh, was allowed to escape from the information he had mm -hmm. in the House Select Committee on Assassinations. But it isn't anything that at this point uh, can really be conclusive, but um, uh, Walter Fauntroy, from an inside position, thought that that, that was the case. Really? Now, and, do you think uh, that meant that meant, of mm -hmm. course, the cooperation with the prison of the prison authorities with James Earl Ray escaping in order to be led around by uh, Raoul, and that that. That meeting in Montreal was not at all accidental. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. Folks, you know our guest tonight is Jim Douglas, and really there's none finer. He's, he's the guy. He's the go-to guy right now, without question for all information on the assassinations. His book, JFK and the Unspeakable, is legendary. And I think it's only been out for 18 months. I don't even think it's two years, Jim, is it? It's not quite two years. There, and it's legendary. I'm telling you, folks, this is an incredible book. I urge you all to get it. It would look great <laughs> when you're doing research on this type of subject matter. This is a must-have. Why he died and why it matters. 
chapters indigo right across the country, www.nightfrightshow.com. Do you think James Earl Ray was cognizant of his role in Martin Luther King's assassination? You had mentioned before he was a patsy. That's why I mention it. I think uh, all of these individuals who are scapegoats or patsies mm -hmm. have roles and have conscious roles in the assassination, uh -huh. but they are not they are not identifying themselves, however, as the scapegoats. <laughs> They're identifying themselves as being involved in other ways in something that uh, either will result in an assassination yeah. or will result in some kind of criminal activity. And for that reason, they're easily controlled. Uh, nothing more easily, no kind of person is more easily controlled than an escaped prisoner. So that's why mm -hmm. James Earl Ray was an ideal candidate. And I also believe that he wasn't the only candidate, nor was Lee Harvey Oswald, for example, the only candidate for killing uh, Chicago, John right. F. Kennedy. There mm -hmm. were many candidates. And in the case of Kennedy, for example, there was a plot in Chicago right. that uh, that I described at some length that uh, to kill him that involved a man with almost exactly the same kind of background as Lee Harvey Oswald. His name was Thomas Arthur Valley. They seem to like That's to right. have three names in their intelligence files. And, um, it's and probably a precondition or something to <laughs> <laughs> making light of a bad well, thing. Also, but, also mm. an easy way to uh, screw around names because then you mm. invert them and so forth. And uh, that is done in all of these cases. Good but point. James James Earl Ray, um, he uh, under the the uh, guidance of Raoul uh, was then controlled um, for. The, uh, most of the year leading up to uh, Martin Luther King's assassination and, and was following the orders of Raoul. And for many, many, many uh, years, uh, the United States government has been saying and says to this day, there is no Raoul other than James Earl Ray's brothers or James Earl Ray's imagination. However, what I said at the beginning of the program is critically important. Read the transcript of the trial, the 13th juror, and you will hear or read uh, the testimony of witness after witness uh, as to the reality of a person whose name is Raul and who uh, was involved in the assassination of Dr. King. And I know mm -hmm. some of those people, they are valid witnesses and they are telling the truth. I should also mention, folks, that was a civil trial in the 90s. Coretta yeah. Scott King was there. Coretta Scott King, of course, is Martin Luther King's wife. And um, also... As were all of his children. There you there go. was always a member Dexter. of the King's family mm -hmm. in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, you've got the whole family there. They obviously felt from day one there was something more sinister, I guess, in the works behind the assassination. And they wanted to find the truth. And I guess they were just never satisfied with the official version, as we should never be. Question everything. This is something I tell my nephews as my nephew looks at Tyler. Tyler looks at me right now. Uh, he's visiting here in Sudbury and he's sitting in the studio. And I tell him all the time, don't I? Question everything. Everything, everything, everything. Turn it upside down and look at it differently. The government is answerable to us. This is a democracy. We are not answerable to the government we put them there to represent us, not the other way around. And this is something that we need to empower ourselves more with. We have to play a more proactive role in the government and in democracy and in our own lives. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. Let's continue with Raoul. Now, I know Raoul goes through a whole kind of a chase scene right across the country, back and forth, back and forth. Do you feel there was any white supremacists involved in the assassination? I'll tell you why. Lamar Waldron was here, and he said he had found some indication that there was some white supremacist input into the assassination. I couldn't hear who, who said that. Lamar Waldron? Um, I think that is a false flag. Really? Ah, interesting. Let's let's talk about that then. That's explosive, Jim. The the idea that um, 
white supremacists lie behind uh, Martin Luther King's assassination is an idea that was brought forward during the House Select Committee on Assassinations, and it's actually in the uh, in the conclusions of the HSCA investigation in the 1970s. And I think from that point on, well, actually, it's it's much earlier than that. James Earl Ray is usually uh, touted as an example of white supremacy. Uh, now, James Earl Ray is the kind of person that, uh, in those days, was referred to as poor white trash. In other words, he's a part of the underclass. He's a person who got kicked around a lot himself. He was a low-level criminal in and out of jails after his Army career, and uh, he's hardly uh, an example of uh, any kind of uh, clan leader or anything of that nature. Mm. And he's the perfect kind of scapegoat to choose for killing Martin Luther King because then you've got uh, a racial feeling of, uh, of vindictiveness toward this, uh, this white man who supposedly killed King. And I think that is a false flag operation from the beginning. And when it is created into a kind of background of conspiracy, um, as the HSCA, uh, some of the the people in that uh, investigation tried to do to pull the heat off um, the FBI, I think that is uh, definitely uh, off track. And uh, I don't agree with that analysis at all. Okay. Fair enough, sir. Fair enough. Um, continuing along with Raoul, now, something that surprised me at the beginning because I always thought Raoul may have pulled a trigger somewhere along the line, but you think not. You think that he was completely not even there. Is that correct? You mean Raoul? No. Uh, did I say Raoul? I meant yes, James, I, I meant James Earl Ray. I apologize. Well, James, James Earl Ray was definitely in, uh, in Memphis on that day. And he had, uh, he had, uh, gone to the boarding house. Uh, he had rented a room, and James Earl Ray says with some witness, sort of indirect witness mm -hmm. testimony, that he was away from the scene at the time that the shot was fired. He says he was going to get a tire repaired at a, at a service station. And there are a couple of witnesses who say they saw a man who looked like him driving in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, but there, the evidence against James Earl Ray being on the site is, of course, his, his rifle, uh, which is left on the site. But the counter evidence is that that rifle and that the rest of the, uh, the, the uh, baggage <laughs> is basically baggage uh, is almost as if he dropped his whole uh, locker room on the street uh, behind the, uh, the boarding house where the shot was supposedly fired um, yeah it had the, his... shot was, the shot was in fact fired from the the trees and the and the um, the high uh, brush directly across from the Lorraine motel but 15 minutes uh, before, or actually I think it was closer to, in terms of the timing the different people mm -hmm. identified, closer to about 10 minutes before the, uh, the shot was fired, the rifle was dropped that supposedly fired the shot. Now that, that testimony was given in the trial by a, 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 uh, a judge, a very well-respected judge here in Birmingham, who in those days was a lawyer for James Earl Ray, and that judge interviewed the man who owned the shop who, in whose doorway the rifle was dropped, and the man said that that rifle, that that rifle and that bag that included the uh, radio, radio yeah. of James Earl Ray, Isn't that included, uh, you know, he, 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 you know, it was sort of like uh, uh, he, he, everything possible had been dropped to implicate Ray. Of course, it had Ray's fingerprints on it. Just to mention to folks, too, this radio was a radio that allegedly James Earl Ray had in prison, and it had his prison number on it. Very convenient. Yeah, it was. It was. 
it was sort of like uh, James Earl Ray had dropped in and left all of this information so that it would be easy to indict him. While James Earl Ray, of course, did have a prison radio. He had bought that rifle in the town where I live right now, Birmingham, mm -hmm. Alabama, at the behest of Raul. And, of course, his fingerprints were all over it. But it was rather suspicious that it was dropped before the shot was fired. So that kind of that kind of uh, testimony is available now, and that's why, again, why I urge folks to get the thirteenth juror and read for themselves uh, and see whether they can believe or not that James Earl Ray uh, killed Dr. Martin Luther King. You're listening to Night Fright. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brandon Holland. Folks, if you're just joining us, like me, you're probably glued to your seat because our guest tonight is Jim Douglas. And uh, he's probably one of the finest, if not the finest, researchers in the world right now, he um, he doesn't have an axe to grind, as Jim Mars said last week. He's a true, honest broker. That's probably because he's Canadian, eh? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, Team Canada won tonight, folks. If you're wondering. all right, there you go. They beat the Russians. <laughs> so. By the way, uh, my daughter yes, Jennifer is now living in Headley. British Columbia, and if she's listening, I say hi and love to her. Oh, that's in our, wonderful. It, we, have a, we still have our house up there in mm -hmm. Italy. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful country, hey, British Columbia? Isn't it wonderful? It is, indeed. Oh, uh, especially the Sunilkameen Valley, where we live. <laughs> wonderful. Folks, of course, Jim Douglas is the author of JFK and the Unspeakable, www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on the book cover. You can order the book from the comfort of your own home. At Chapters and to go online. That's where that link will take you. Or just go to a Chapters and to go and get pick up the book uh, physically. Um, you've got to have this book. And it's uh, a great addition to your library. The research is impeccable. And it answers why JFK was killed. And that is the most important thing. Because, like I said before, the rest is just smoke and mirrors and Oswald and all these guys coming in, like Oliver Stone's movie says. But why was he killed? Why was he taken out? Why was Malcolm X taken out? Why was Dr. King taken out? Why was Bobby taken out? Four of the biggest leaders coming out for peace in the 60s, gone in a flash within, was five years, gone, completely gone. Talk about a coup. It cut off all the intellectuals, almost all the intellectuals, I should say, and silenced the others very, very effectively. Jim, let's bring it up to present. We had talked before about the various templates. I also think a template to a certain extent or perhaps some kind of conspiracy was put in place. I'm going to bring up Ted Kennedy right now, Chappaquiddick. It seems he was all set to run for the presidency and all of a sudden Chappaquiddick hit. And the story behind that is just bizarre. He was, he swam, he was tired, he fell asleep, he woke up, and then he, somebody was dead already. And it's absolutely bizarre. Obviously, the story is not as we, as we have been told, but do you think perhaps the powers that be saw another Kennedy in the White House and said, how do we do this and get rid of him? Speculation's I fine. I think that that's a very credible hypothesis a very credible hypothesis, and it was certainly uh, JFK number one and RFK number two, mm -hmm. and then we can just ask questions and explore the further possibilities, and because Ted Kennedy uh, did not come forth with the full truth of Chappaquiddick, we have to do a lot of speculation, and I don't, I haven't investigated Chappaquiddick, and I can't uh, present the kind of information that would be based on any real factual data. I think that it is conceivable, as some people have hypothesized, that he uh, was perhaps uh, subjected to pressures on that night that placed him in a position where he felt he couldn't get out of it except by telling the story that he did. 
I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if intelligence forces were involved in uh, in the death of uh, um, the woman who went down in the car. Oh, uh, uh, Mary, uh, um, Mary, what was her name? Mary Something? Jo Kopechny. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know any of those uh, details, and I and I don't know if there are if there's anybody alive today who knows the de- mm. the full details of Chappaquiddick. So I really can't I really can't say, but I I think that it is a credible hypothesis that there's something that there's much more behind it than we know. But yeah, I agree with I, you. I can I can't I couldn't do anything more than speculate about it. Keeping along the same lines of speculation, yeah. I'd like to bring up another president that I thought would have been a two-term president, and he was a broker of peace. I'm talking about President Jimmy Carter, of course, folks. He was a one-term president. Not, he was the only guy that brought peace between Egypt and Israel. He's a yeah. broker of peace. He wanted to resolve the Iranian hostage crisis through dialogue and not send the army in. He was kind of forced to send the army in. They kind of put all kinds of, all the hawks put pressure on him, and it turned out to be a disaster. Do you think part of the reason he was a one-term president, perhaps because he was a broker for peace and wanted to do things more in a dialogue way? Oh, yes. I, I, and I think there's, there's strong evidence of that, which... Um, isn't clear enough to me now in my memory <laughs> to go into in detail, but there was something called uh, the October Surprise, and there was there was a, an entire stage of uh, keeping um, peace from coming uh, in terms of the uh, the hostages during the period leading up to the election. That was part of the undermining of of uh, President uh, uh, Carter's uh, attempt at re-election. So, I think the the hostage crisis, uh, the Iranian hostage crisis, could have been resolved had it not been for uh, counter forces to Carter trying to keep him from being elected. And of course, the fact that he couldn't resolve that crisis was a major factor in his defeat in the election to the uh, the new president, uh, Ronald Reagan. Now I want to bring it up. The reason why I wanted to show these two precedences, and I mentioned them, is because I'm concerned for Barack Obama. You know, Abraham Bolden was here, and he brought it up to me. He said the same forces that were in place in the Secret Service back when he, Abraham Bolden, folks, of course, first African-American Secret Service agent, handpicked by JFK himself, uh, blew the whistle. And a good on, friend of mine, a wonderful person. Oh, he's an amazing guy. And one hell of a musician, too, folks, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and Abraham, I know you're listening. We are going to jam, my friend. Oh, there man, are we going to jam. All that to say is he was very concerned about Obama's safety. He said the same things that were going on in the Secret Service are still continuing to this day. And I'm concerned. I'm concerned that that damn template from all those years ago that... You know, the four assassinations, and I'm not going to say assassination in the president's name in the same sentence, but I'm concerned. How do you feel? Well, I've been concerned uh, ever since Obama began running for the presidency, but mm-hmm. I've been concerned um, about uh, other people in the last several decades uh, who have been in similar positions. And uh, in the case of, of uh, Barack Obama, of course, he's African-American, mm-hmm. as well as being president of the United States. And a lot of people have seen the threat to his life in terms of his being an African-American, which is f- for real. It is, it is definitely there. I think a more uh, uh, difficult uh, question is the one raised by Abraham Bolden by the people that are supposed to protect the president. And had Barack Obama made a decision significantly different than the one he did last fall uh, regarding Afghanistan, um, I think there would have been a rebellion in the Pentagon. Mm. It was quite clear that he was being set up. The General McChrystal, who mm-hmm. was, uh, quote, requesting very publicly, he was lobbying. It was hardly, uh, it was hardly a quiet yeah, request. Um, uh, Obama had said to him, uh, we know this from various sources, it's been published in various places, 
Obama had said to him uh, last summer, I don't want you to be asking me for more troops in Afghanistan. And McChrystal went out and uh, countered to that uh, council, <laughs> uh, one could call it an order from the president. He went out and did exactly the opposite thing and set up Obama publicly so that if Obama had not uh, ordered the escalation of troops as he did, mm-hmm. uh, he would be undermined both publicly and uh, perhaps uh, privately by the powers that be, especially in the in the Pentagon intelligence agencies. So he was he was he was set up mm-hmm. last fall. That was quite clear, and uh, unfortunately, um, he was placed in a very very difficult position. Now Kennedy had that situation countless times. And um, I hope that President Obama will be able to face it down as he continues his um, his presidency. It's very, very difficult to stand Extremely. up to the powers that be. Extremely. And you know, Jim, when you mentioned McChrystal and him going public, it yes. reminded me of General MacArthur and Truman. Yes. Um, and also in the case of Kennedy, General yes. Curtis... LeMay, LeMay uh, mm-hmm. and uh, forces like General Walker, yes. the person who, whom a lot of people forget about today, but General Walker over in Europe had uh, been propagandizing his troops with, uh, with um, anti-communist, anti-communist uh, materials, mm-hmm. and Kennedy fired him, and uh, General Walker became a very public nemesis of his, and... Uh, was involved indirectly in the whole scene in uh, in Dallas. That's right. And actually, Walker wanted to run for presidency. And he his... did run as as General Lemay's. Uh, he ran. He yes, ran with General yes, LeMay. Yes. For, That's what I was going to bring up. Yeah. He was the vice presidential mm-hmm. candidate with LeMay in the next mm-hmm. election. <laughs> mm-hmm. Isn't that wild? It, I mean, you know, oh man, um, very very scary. And then you couple into all of this the warning by. The president after Truman, of course, was um, Eisenhower, and, and he came out and phrased it, the military-industrial complex. He warned the nation about this. And let's not forget Truman's warning. Yes, sir. Truman, one month to the day after Kennedy's assassination, warned that the Central Intelligence Agency, he was very specific in an article that was published in uh, the Washington Post, uh, he said... The Central Intelligence Agencies was was doing things that he never authorized them to do and that were disturbing him deeply. And for him to have made that statement one month to the day after JFK's assassination was like a huge alarm bell going off in the United States. And that alarm bell was silenced immediately. It was republished nowhere. And, you know, everybody has mixed feelings about Nixon. And yet Nixon brokered a peace between the three adversaries, China, Russia, Soviet Union back then, Mm -hmm. and the U.S., and look what happened to him. And one can only wonder. There are a lot of questions about Watergate. Oh, boy, is there ever. And trust me, folks, I'm no Nixon fan, but I'm saying look at the big picture. Yes. And that's very important. Look at the details as well. And none better than Jim Douglas. And if you want to know why Kennedy was killed, you can plug your book, Jim. JFK and the Unspeakable, why he died, why it matters. Chapters in to go right across the country, of course. Accolades galore from everybody in the community and beyond. Oliver Stone loves the book. Um, geez, maybe he'll option it off you. It'd be JFK, too. Wouldn't that I be should, sweet? I should mention about uh, President Truman's warning that um, after he he made that statement, he was visited by a member of the Warren Commission really? and um, asked to withdraw the statement. We know this because of uh, the archives at the Truman Library, and we know who the person was from the Warren Commission who asked him to withdraw that statement because he put it down in a memorandum to the Central mm-hmm. Intelligence Agency. And his name is Alan Dulles, and he was the former head of the CIA, and he had been fired by President Kennedy, who said, at the time, I want to splinter the CIA in a thousand pieces mm-hmm. and scatter it to the winds. That is the man who asked Truman to withdraw his statement. 
Truman not only refused, he re- kept repeating it, and he repeated it to a, an editor of Look magazine uh, the following summer when Look published an, an article on the CIA, which Truman thought involved uh, uh, a number of uh, falsities. Holy cow. Alan Dulles, the man who should have been a prime um, candidate for uh, suspicion mm-hmm. of the murder of President Kennedy, uh, was going around um, as a member of the Warren Commission and trying to silence President Truman from raising questions about the CIA's possible involvement in the assassination. I didn't know that. I knew Dallas, of course, was in charge of the Warren Commission, but I had no idea he was doing that behind the scenes. I also knew that President, at the time, uh, he wasn't a president. Ford was on the Warren Commission. And he president was, Ford was on the Warren yes. Commission, a very key member of the Warren Commission. President Ford was the go-between uh, from FBI. the Warren Commission to the FBI, mm-hmm. And, of course, Alan Dulles uh, was the go-between to the Central Intelligence Agency. Wow. So it's like the FBI and the CIA were sitting in on every meeting. Unbelievable. And this is what was running the country and perhaps still is. It scares me when I see the same things happening over and over and over again. And one can only wonder who is or what is the next adversary after terrorism. But let's see what comes up, because I'm sure something will. I'm sure it's all been planned out years in advance. Very, very scary stuff. You're listening to Night Fright. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. Our guest tonight, folks, Jim Douglas. None better. JFK and the Unspeakable, why he died, why it matters. We're also talking about the life and times and how all these things tie in the four assassinations, the life and times of Dr. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and how it all, you know, we're trying to bring it all together to give you the big picture. We've gone back before the assassinations of those two to JFK and uh, gone as far back as Truman and we've gone as far forward as today. Barack Obama and I, I am concerned for his safety. Let's, let's, yes, sir. Could we speak for a, a minute, Brent, about what you call the big picture? Yes, sir. And I think the, the big picture involves uh, more so than uh, the, the powers that be. It involves the powers of, well, I guess you could say the powers that we are, mm-hmm. the powers that are represented by King's vision of the beloved community and Malcolm mm-hmm. X's vision of martyrdom. One of the things that Malcolm said just two to three days before he died, I think it was three days before, when he was talking to a, a photographer friend of his, he said that the only thing that can save uh, this country, he was talking about the U.S. at the time, but he could also have been talking about the world mm-hmm. as he was, uh, was martyrdom. He said, um, I think that I'm going to have to be a martyr, and that's the only thing he said he thought could save the country. Now, martyr, as, as we know from the origin of the word, means being a witness, means being a, giving a testimony, it means uh, having a vision, it means uh, seeing something um, about where we're supposed to go. And it means being willing to accept the consequences of that, as, of course, people are willing to do when they go to war. Well, Malcolm X and Dr. King, as he said in uh, statements that you've quoted on your program and that we've heard, uh, he, he thought that uh, he might not see the promised land himself, but he thought that his people would. And by his people, he meant not only African Americans, as represented by the President of the United States today, especially, we're all represented by Barack Obama, and uh, we're all represented by anybody who's going to be hopefully moving in a direction of justice and peace. And the power that Martin Luther King envisioned and Malcolm X envisioned and were willing to die for is really a a power that another person whose life and death I'm investigating, Mohandas Gandhi, envisioned, uh, really? and I think as Dr. King did also, as the most powerful force in the universe. It isn't like this is something mm-hmm. that uh, you do in a demonstration. It's something that 
is uh, the the force of transformation. Uh, it's it's the power of of life itself. It's the power that Gandhi called satyagraha, truth force. Uh, the way he put it in his theology was that truth is God. Truth is God, and that means that every person on the face of the earth has that God, uh, believes in that God. Everybody believes in his or her truth, everybody believes in a force uh, within himself or herself to live by and hopefully to die by. And when you come across Gandhi, it just means putting that to a <laughs> a further test or two or three mm-hmm. or four or 500 or a thousand, and the same thing with uh, Dr. King or Malcolm X. So it isn't a matter of, of anybody being without that. And when you come together in community, King calls it the beloved community. Uh, Jesus called it the the reign of God or the kingdom of God. And uh, uh, Malcolm saw it in in terms of uh, uh, the Hajj and uh, the the vision that he experienced in the midst of people from all over the world. When people get together that way, <clears throat> these these forces that we're talking about behind the assassinations, they have nowhere to go. That it's it's a it's a house of cards, and it's based on lying. So the <clears throat> the main power in the assassination is not guns. The main power is lies, and guns and lies go together. <laughs> and so we have to go together <clears throat> or come together in truth, and um, that power is the power of transformation. So I just wanted to to mention that perspective, which is far far bigger than any of the killings, and it's the the basic reason behind the killings is that these people um, who are prophets and who are uh, visionaries represent a force that's present in all of us. So um, if we're willing to walk our talk or walk our truth, we can expect similar consequences, and that's not a bad thing. It means that we're coming together in such a way that big change is going to occur, and we can see the sign of it in terms of... Um, you know, difficulties. And so experience difficulties and welcome them and and walk the truth. That's beautiful, Jim. That's just beautiful. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. Folks, Jim Douglas, none better. Get his book when you can, JFK and the Unspeakable. Jim, just a couple of things. We're going to have to start to wrap up. First thing, I just want to let you know, um, on my other show, I had the great honor, incredible honor, to interview Minnie Jean Brown. She is one of the Little Rock Nine, original members of the Little Rock Nine. And I asked her extensively what she thought of Barack Obama, and she just shook her head, looked down, and said, he has the weight of the universe on his shoulders. That's right. She says, I don't know how we can stand up. That is the type of pressure on this man. Jackie Robinson, to a certain degree, had the same type of thing, but differently. I wish him well. I sincerely do. The other thing I wanted to ask you, you had mentioned in the beginning of the program, there was a military sniper team involved in the assassination of Dr. King. There was. Can you speak to that, sir? The witness in the trial was uh, who spoke on videotape because of his health being very, very seriously impaired, uh, an intelligence agent described the sniper team that was present in uh, in Memphis because he knew uh, was, I, I, I guess you'd say, very close friends, maybe even best friends with one of the members of the sniper team who... Um, himself died in under very suspicious circumstances <laughs> and after all of these events took place mm-hmm. and the uh the witness uh which a juror whom I interviewed said was just uh awesome the testimony was just awesome to all of the jury uh he said that his friend who was a member of the sniper team had been trained for a shooting uh as part of a a special forces sniper team, a National Guard unit, which incidentally is 
<laughs> is based uh, about three blocks from where I'm sitting right now in Birmingham, Alabama. It still exists. Wow. And that that team um, had uh, been prepared for a shooting without the target being identified, and they were drawn uh, into, they were taken into the vicinity of Memphis, and then they were supposed to go into Memphis on April 4, 1968, and at the very last minute, um, according to this witness, they their time there was uh, was uh, their being there was was canceled, and it's unclear. Of course, he he was given this information by a man who then died, and it was only given to him uh, in such in situations where the man you know confessed it and described it in, in in under some a lot of personal stress just even talking about it. So it's a little bit unclear whether the the sniper team actually got into Memphis and went on to the buildings where they were supposed to go, both buildings and um, a water tower, and and came to the point where they were actually had their rifles pointed at Dr. King or whether it was canceled just as they were coming into town. But it's quite clear that they recognized the next day who their target was and that it was Martin Luther King wow. because they they realized everything that they were being told and how they were being led up to it and their target having been in Memphis that that's what it was all about that testimony uh, which I I witnessed on videotape but again you can read it again you can read it all in the uh, in the 13th juror that testimony being available today um, in the uh, in the book, the Thirteenth Juror, which is the transcript of the trial. Now, I should also mention about this trial, folks. There was only two journalists there, or I should say, three journalists. And uh, you know, where the heck were the mainstream media? This is what I don't understand. And those three folks that were there, of course, Jim was one, and he had mentioned Wesley. Was it Wesley, my friend? No, it was. Um, uh, I'm trying to. All of a sudden, I've gone. Uh, Blank. On, on, on blank. Um, That's okay, I've done that all night. Don't worry about it. Um, I can't. Um, she was. It was a she, wasn't it? She was. Oh well. No, my friend, uh, Memphis TV reporter was Wendell Stacy, and then there was a woman uh, named Barbara Reese, That's right. who was a correspondent for the Lisbon Daily Publico, right. who was there several days. I knew she was. Familiar. And I shouldn't yeah. say that there weren't any other journalists present. I'm talking about for the entire trial. For the entire trial. That's journalists what I meant. came yeah. and went, and uh, and the last, the New York Times was there. The last two to three days, the the reporter sat next to me. Uh, but that was after all the testimony had ended. Uh, so all she heard were the the uh, summaries before the jury. She heard none of the testimony. And then she wrote an article that did appear in the New York Times on the front page immediately uh, at the conclusion of the trial, which derided the whole thing, uh, said the judge had been asleep, the jury was nodding, um, that uh, it was a... You know, it was just a, a, a total um, uh, attack upon the trial, and I was sitting next to her, and I observed the same thing she did, except that I observed them for three weeks, and she observed them for uh, two to three days, and uh, heard none of the testimony. Mm. And um, it was a mockery of, a, of an article. Folks, Jim Douglas. Jim, we're going to have to wrap up now. Is there anything that you would like to say to the folks that are listening right now? And I want to ask you, what's next for you? I know you, you're working on this book, and you've been working on it for mm, the better part of a year, I guess, maybe longer. Besides, you know, and well, a little bit longer, more like uh, uh, since 1995, because I've worked cow, simultaneously. Yeah. You don't work on just one one no, of these. I know. Uh, I know. You work on them sort of simultaneously. So the the, the JFK book had to be written first mm -hmm. because that's chronologically the first of these stories. But um, actually, my editor's a little bit upset because I, I'm writing about Gandhi now too. And the reason <laughs> he said, "Are you going to the point now? You're going to write next about Lincoln?" And I said, "No, no, I'm, I'm, no." The reason I'm writing about Gandhi is mm -hmm. because Gandhi's assassination, in some ways prefigures Malcolm X and Martin Luther King's, and I found it important to to uh, say some things about Gandhi's assassination that uh, that lead into Malcolm's and Martin's. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
I'm working on those three together right now. I'm really excited for this book to come out. I truly am. I've read, I should say, uh, JFK and the Unspeakable several times. And it really is an impeccable book, folks. If you're looking for your first book on the assassination, or if you're an officiato and you have a whole library of books already, you cannot be without this book. It is that important. JFK and the Unspeakable, why he died and why it matters. James W. Douglas, as always, www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on the book cover, Chapters Indigo, order it online, or just go right down to Chapters Indigo. Jim, I want to thank you again so much for coming on the show and taking the time out of your schedule and uh, speaking to the folks, because I know... You know, the ratings go, they shoot through the ceiling, as I say, when you come on the show. And I really do appreciate that. And it speaks well for the community that everybody tunes in to hear you because you are so astute and your integrity speaks for itself. And I think that speaks volumes. Like Oliver Stone said, you know, it's uh, now an extraordinary new book. And it is an extraordinary book. This book is James Douglas's JFK and the Unspeakable. Terrific. Thank you so much, my friend, and God bless you always. Thank you, Brent, and thanks for giving me an opportunity to be up there (laughs) rather than down here for at least one night. You're very welcome. And if you're ever in the neighborhood, please, it would be my great honor and pleasure to have you for supper. Okay, I'd love to be in Sudbury, and when you come down to uh, Birmingham, you can uh, have some dinner at uh, our Catholic Worker House down here. Wonderful. My wife Shelley and I have, it's called Mary's House, and That goes for anybody up there in Sudbury or anywhere across the country. Thank you so much, my friend, and have a great night. And the same to you, Brad. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, James Douglas, as I said before, he is none better. All I can tell you, I'm looking at the time, and I know I'm going over a little bit, but uh, certainly when you have somebody of this caliber on the show, you want to spend as much time as you possibly can with them. You're listening to Night Fright. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. Just to mention, coming up next week once more, we start our whole month in March 2012. We're going to start off next week with Dr. Bob Thiel, and we're going to be looking at the rise of the secret sect. Uh, And he writes eight world events aligning with prophecies in the book 2012 and the rise of the secret sect, which is Dr. Bob Thiel's book, have already come to pass since that book came out in September 2009. Find out which of the hundreds of prophecies it documents will affect you. We're going to look at that next week. Uh, The week after that, 2012, Science or Superstition with Alexandra Bruce. Brand new, terrific book she's got out on 2012. She writes, how did 2012 come to mean the end of time? Did psychedelics facilitate the Maya Cosmovision? We're going to look at all um, the lore, the myths surrounding 2012 and look at them one by one. It's going to be a heck of a ride. Let me tell you, the whole month is incredible guests. We've got our Joshua Shapiro coming on, Crystal Skulls in 2012. You all saw, I'm sure everybody's seen by now, the Indiana Jones movie, uh, The Crystal Skulls. We're going to be looking at that, Hopi prophecies, all kinds of different things. That's going to be the week after. That's going to be the week of the 17th in March. The final week, we're going to be looking at the apocalypse in 2012. Oh, baby, what a show that is. Live from Brussels. Stand by for that one and keep the lights on because this is going to creep you out beyond belief. I'm Brent Holland for Night Fright. I want to thank my nephew Tyler for joining me in the studio tonight. So for all those folks, I'm Brent Holland. And uh, thank you so much for listening to Night Fright and making Night Fright the number one Canadian-based show of its genre in the country. By the way, go Team Canada. Go. See you next time. You're listening to Night Fright and your host, Brent Holland. The time is now. 
voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. 